Sonic Lost World, the most forgotten Sonic game of all. The first game since 06 to not use the boost gameplay, Lost World completely changes up the gameplay for a parkour intensive experience, along with a Mario Galaxy inspired level design, having a mixed reception from the fanbase overall. But today, we are not going to discuss how good the game is. Today, I'll show you the cut content, the betas, the demos, the secrets and the things that you probably didn't know about the games. Most of the stuff covered is already documented on the Sonic Wiki, Sonic Retro, the Cutting Room Floor and Hedge Dogs, so this video is for those of you who are too lazy to do the research yourselves. I want to thank all modders and researchers and data miners and everyone that has made this possible. I also recommend checking out Cybershell's bonus videos on Sonic 2 and Sonic 3, as that's where I got the video and title idea from. In these types of videos, I always like to start by covering the cut content first, and then analyze some betas, prototypes, trailers and concept art of the games, and then end with a little bit of trivia, showing you some hidden and obscure facts that you might have not known about the games. At first, I thought that Lost World would be one of the games with the least cut or unused content to cover, but it turns out that it actually features quite a lot more than I expected. This game also features three distinct versions, the Wii U release, the 3DS release and the PC release, which is a part of the Wii U version, but I'll merge these two versions into one section, since they share a lot of the same content. So, let's start by covering the 3DS's cut content. Sadly, this version has the least cut content out of any other, it only has this leftover texture, being a UI element that translates from Japanese to game coin and material respectively. So, now let's get into the Wii U and PC versions of the game. These ones have a lot more leftover content in comparison, as you might expect. Much like Sonic Colors and Forces, there is a file called xtgmission.lua present inside the game's archives, which, in that game, featured some developer notes to identify each level layout. What was interesting there is that there were a lot of names that were seemingly early names for some stages in the games and never made the final cut. The same is the case in Lost World, featuring some some pretty interesting details about the stages. Firstly, there is a leftover entry for Act 1 of Tropical Resort left over in the file. This entry specifically features some changes made for the format used for the Lost World Lua parser, while still retaining some values exclusive to the colors format, which just makes the situation other. There are also a few test levels from colors that were seemingly reused in Lost World. The only notable difference here is the inclusion of the asteroid wisp within this stages. These seem to be the same test stages present in that game, as they feature the exact same name and title, such as stage 905 being multi-object test map. There are also several levels that were removed from the game, which entries are still present in this Lua file. These are stages AO2, AO3, AO4 and AO5 for Desert Ruins, translated to Sky Chase, Ancient City, Japanese Spider Crab and Inside the Sandworm Body, respectively. Stage AO7 for Tropical Coast, which translates to Tropical Beach 2, which is the name given to the final's first act. Stages AO2, AO5 and C01 for Windy Hill, translated to Indy Cave, which is the name given to the final's act 3, Moai and Kinto Un, as in the Flying Nimbus from Dragon Ball, respectively. And stages AO2 and AO3 for Frozen Factory, translated to Indy Cave 2 and Ilomilo Suites, which are the name given to the final Silent Forest Act 3 and Desert Ruins Act 3, respectively. On that topic, the final stages entries feature pretty different names to identify each layout. I won't cover every single one, just the ones that stood out to me. Windy Hill Act 1 is referred to as Glass Hill. Windy Hill Act 2 is referred to as Moonlight. Desert Ruins Act 3 is called Ilomilo Suites, as I've said before. Ilomilo is a game? 
apparently. I'm not a Nilo Milo connoisseur, so I don't really know what this is supposed to mean. Frozen Factory Act 1 is called Military Factory for some reason. Sky Road Act 1 is referred to as Great Nar Army, whatever that means. The Caterpillar Badnik is called Nal, maybe it's referring to it? Some other stages also feature two at the end of their names to reference that they're the exact same concept as other stages, such as Moonlight 2, while others have weird as hell names that seemingly have nothing to do with the stage, such as Hidden World Act 4 being called Baku Baku Scaffolding. I mean, the theme of the stage kinda looks like the Baku Baku Animal game, but what the fuck is the scaffolding? Another file called testmission.lua is present in the files, much like in Sonic Colors. In Colors, or Colors Ultimate rather, this file had some information for the test stages. The same happens in Lost World, which appears to have a bunch of test levels removed from the game, which would have been present inside a folder named test in the root of the file system. Some of these entries are using the naming scheme from colors for stage names, being stage 101 for example, while others are named according to the scheme standardized in Lost World, being something like W1A01. All of these entries have mission text written in English to identify them, but some do feature text in Japanese for more specific descriptions, such as collision test map, shooting studio or design test map 2 dark sides. Interestingly, these entries mention wisps that are not present in the game at all only being used in colors, such as Spike for Spikes, Puzzle for Cube and Rodeo for Frenzy, only featuring one of the new six wisps introduced in this game, being Asteroids. Even then, this wisp isn't present in all of the entries. Another interesting file is left over in the game, called actstgdata.lua. This file specifically reveals what the game's original level order was supposed to be like, which is very interesting. Many of the level entries here feature a ton of levels that have been removed in the final game, more specifically the ones I mentioned a bit ago. Even then, there are plenty of changes that we can dissect in this list. For Windy Hill, the sequence starts off just like the final, but swiftly changes gears by heading into to AO2 instead of AO3. I'll be omitting the W1, W2, etc. parts of the names, as it just makes things more confusing. Though I'll quickly explain what that is. It's meant to identify what act belongs to each stage, or world in the naming's case. You can see on the screen which number belongs to each stage, so it's easier to understand. Though not every stage follows this format exactly, for reasons we're gonna see now. Checking the description of the AO2 level, it matches up with the final game's Act 3, suggesting the two stages are the same, however their starting positions don't line up at all. The following level is AO3, meaning Act 3 and Act 2 were likely swapped early in development. The order continues with AO4, which is used as Skyroad Act 1 in the final, weirdly enough. This suggests that this level was meant to be used in Windy Hill, which is supported by the fact that the level shares a very similar look with that area, reusing a bunch of level geometry. AO5 5 shares its description with Silent Forest Act 4, suggesting that, like the previous stage, it was to come much sooner into the game. However, once again, the starting positions are hugely different. Interestingly, looking at the final Silent Forest Act 4 data, there are a few leftover objects in the sky around the cut AO5 spawn position. The spawn being so close to the goal ring means the level was more than likely supposed to start close to its end. Finally for Windy Hill, there is C01. Taking note of the change from A to C, it seems the level wasn't meant to be a normal act, rather a challenge level. Looking at the description once again, it reveals that the this level is none other than Hidden World Act 1. However, once again, there is a small difference in starting locations. This leaves the final game second encounter with Zaz in Act 4 nowhere to be seen, as it is referred to in the finals files as AO6, which doesn't exist anywhere in the original level order. Desert Ruins also starts very strong, just like the final, but immediately fucks it up by going into AO2 instead of XB01, which is the beehive level in the final. Check Checking the description of the level, it matches up with Hidden World Act 2. The entry for AO2 also features the Sky Chase tag, meaning that it would also be a level in the tornado just like the final. Interestingly, Cut Test Level Stage 823 has a Japanese comment which references this level, translating to World 2-2 Diameter 20M Test.
AO3, AO4 and AO5 are all scrap levels that I covered earlier, with no counterpart in the final game, being the Ancient City, Japanese Spider Crab and Sandworm Body stages. CO1 is the final level of the original order for Desert Ruins, but it's actually used as Sky Road Act 4 in the final game. The aesthetics of the area do match up with the look of this stage, so it's likely that this level really was supposed to be there. The translation of the level roughly translates to Yellow Triple Spring, meaning it was probably going to function like the Yellow Spring levels from Colors, as the moving springs in the level behave very similarly to those. From here on out, the original level order becomes very segmented, with barely any trace left of it. For Tropical Coast, the only unseen level is AO7, which does not have a counterpart in the final game. It has the same description as Act 1, which does go used in the final, with a 2 at the end of it, which, as I've said before, probably means that it was supposed to be a continuation of the level. Frozen Factory starts the same as the final, with the first level being AO1, though the second level is AO2 instead of AO4. However, checking the description of the level, it matches up with Silent Forest Act 3 for some reason, meaning that they are probably the same stage. The third level is AO3 instead of x 1 which is the casino level. The description of this level matches up with Desert Ruins Act 3, weirdly enough. The latter's configuration file is still called w4ao3config.lua, however, the brief section states it's a configuration file for w2ao5. The interesting part is that neither of these levels exist in the final. Silent Forest only has AO1 in its entries, which is the final's Act 1. Sky Road has AO3 and AO5. AO3 is actually the secret level of Tropical Coast in the final game. As most of Sky Road's levels seem to come from Elsewhere, it's hard to make a proper judgement on whether the stage would aesthetically belong in Sky Road or not, but it does play very similarly to Sky Road Act 3. Its config file also states that the stage does belong to Sky Road. I guess I didn't really explain that some stages, such as this one, are identified as belonging to, for example, World 6, which is Sky Road here, but belong to stages such as Tropical Coast, which is World 3. This happens because the original level order was changed, if you didn't guess by now. Looking at the final game's levels, there seems to be a gap of missing levels that aren't referenced in the original level order. For Tropical Coast, AO2, AO4 and CO1 are nowhere to be seen. It's possible that these levels were turned into one of the levels that don't start with a world number, or that they didn't even exist to begin with. Interestingly, test level WOAO4 has the following comment, which is about the cut level AO5, roughly translating to side view casino test. This means that this level could have turned into Frozen Factory Act 3 later in development. Frozen Factory specifically doesn't feature AO5 or CO1 anywhere. Silent Forest doesn't feature AO4, AO5, AO6 or CO1. AO3 is actually the second level of Sky Road in the final game which does match up with the aesthetic of the stage, meaning that it would have belonged to Silent Forest at some point. And lastly, Lava Mountain doesn't feature any levels in this Lua file. Let's take a break from stages now, and look at some unused audios. There is an unused jingle left over in the Wii U version. <laughs> This song is included alongside other used variants. Its file name features an NG tag, which is an abbreviation for no good. Eggman also has a few unused voice lines. Ho 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 ho! Prepare yourself to think that I'd actually have to do this myself. Always getting in the way of my plans. <coughs> 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 I won't... I won't let you get away with this. No! You're... you're not getting away with this. I'm sick of you getting in the way every single time. This is it. This is really it. Impossible. My sublime, magnificent plan. Ah, not again!
They don't seem to hint at anything interesting in particular, though some have apparently been used in the 3DS version and forces. There are also a few objects from Generations and Colors left over in the files, which don't go used at all. They use the older version of the model format seen in Unleashed and Generations, all of which have an underscore HD suffix at the end of their file names. An interesting hint goes unused in the game as well. While what the hint says is possible in Windy Hill Act 2, it is the only stage where this can actually be done, as it is also the only time Sonic interacts with water in his regular form. However, this hint still doesn't appear for some reason. As I've mentioned, there are a few unused color powers left over in the files. These are for the cube, spikes and frenzy, but there is also an unused snake transformation. How it would have been like is anyone's guess. There are also unused animations for the spikes wisp left over in the files. The animation seems to be the exact same as the one from Colors, though ported to the new model, meaning that this Wisp at least made it further than conceptualization, I guess. Another Colors left over, and more of a curiosity, a bunch of source paths within the game mentioned Sonic 2010, which is the internal name as well as the root folder for its files. Interestingly, Sonic Lost World is referred internally as Sonic 2013. Left over in the PC files is a video called Opening Underscore Trial. It's a leftover from the Wii U demo that made it onto the PC port somehow. There also exist copies of the first two cutscenes of the game with a trial tag added onto the end, despite being the exact same cutscenes as the final ones. There is also a very interesting video in the files called SLW Brawl Kiosk 14th May, depicting an early build of the game, which I'll cover in a bit as well. The PC version has an unused option called SSAO. SSAO stands for Screen Space Ambient Occlusion, and was originally originally planned to be added in the video settings tab, but was eventually scrapped. It's the only option in the game that does not have text stroke effects, and has a bubble that is hexagonal in shape, rather than a circle. Weirdly, this setting is impossible to turn on, even if it doesn't do anything. A gold ring is also unused in the PC port. It is actually used in multiplayer in the Wii U version, but the Windows version removed the mode, so the gold ring goes completely unused. However, its model, sound effects and code remain in the game, being fully functional as well. Also unused are what appears to be a water shield and an oxygen meter. Running out of oxygen won't do anything, and the shield seems to have no effect too. In the final game, you never go underwater in normal play. However, if you hack the game and manage to go underwater in regular form, the water has no collision at all and behaves like normal ground, so it is likely that at some point there were supposed to be actual underwater sections, but they were eventually scrapped along with everything else. To accompany this, there is also an unused drowning animation for Sonic. Even though the Yoshi and Zelda DLCs don't exist in the PC version, the enemies present in those levels are still left over in the files, properly converted by the game's porting team. None of the actual stages or their elements are included though. On the same note, the loft wing in the Zelda DLC appears five times throughout the level, which are the two same objects appearing but just multiple times. However, there is a hidden third one that can never Never be seen. If it were to be enabled properly, it would crash the game when it would start to move, as it has no movement path. The reason for its removal is anyone's guess. Weirdly, an unused boost gauge meter is left over in the files. This UI element has no textures, thus we can only see a blank layout. It has the same gradient colors shared with the colors boost gauge, and appears to be positioned and occupy the same space as that one. It could have likely been the exact same texture as the colors boost meter, but was eventually removed. Interestingly, applying a texture to this leftover element in a UI editor allows you to preview the gradient, which is the exact same as colors. The Wii U version has an unused state for the Zelda goal call object in the DLC, being called End Up. This state makes the Triforce start hovering again after Sonic picks it up. The Wii U executable has a bunch of leftovers of the game's editor. There is code for handling very various editor tasks, modifying parameters, etc. This leaves us wondering if there is an actual embedded editor in the game, but there probably isn't, considering that it hasn't been discovered yet. These leftovers are kind of interesting, as it turns out that every single object has parameter names in the executable, with Japanese comments describing what it does and how to use them. A rough translation of these presents a few amusing comments
talents, as well as a few odd names for bosses and enemies. On the same note, did you know that there is a leftover debug menu here? The xtgdata.lua file, which featured the original level order, was only meant to be used by the game's debug menu, which does not exist in the final release. However, since it is a leftover, of course a mod was made to re-implement it by Sajid, so a big shout out to them. This developer menu seems to feature nothing but a simple UI where you can select some options and also a config window, where you can change some settings that help in exploring these. I also want to thank Windy for translating some of the Japanese names for me. Make sure to check her channel out, she works very hard and posts very interesting translations of various Sonic media. The first tab is Stage Select. As its name suggests, it allows you to load into any stage of your liking. Firstly, the World 1 to World 8 folders allow you to load into any normal level act, with no other side effects. There are a few other nuances though. The first folder, which translates to minigame has all of the unused Wii U minigames left over in the games files. They don't really work at all unless you set the minigame mode option in the config to true. Even then, the UI seems to be a little bit too large for it to be playable. The option below, which translates to battle, loads the multiplayer object layouts, also left over and completely unused in the PC version. The DLC folder has all the DLC stages, being the Yoshi, Knights and Zelda stages. However, However, the Knights level is the only one that works. Selecting any of the other two will crash the game, as their files have been removed from the final port. The last option, which translates to test stage, has a bunch of, you guessed it, test levels that are missing from the files. They seem to be the same test stage as I covered in the test mission.lua file. Their names are all in Japanese, but translating this gives us a few interesting names. Some names here are actually the names given to some final stages with Indy Cave being Windy Hill Act 3, Moonlight Windy Hill Act 2, and Moai was supposed to be Windy Hill Act 5, apparently. Actually, a lot of these test levels have the stages and the act they are supposed to be tests of in their name. Windy Hill Act 1 is Proto Split, Desert Ruins Act 1 is Great Periphery Test, Act 6 is Tornado Test, and Act 2 is Diameter 20M Test, while Silent Forest Act 5 is Side View Casino Test, which which is weird considering that the casino level is Frozen Factory Act 3. The most interesting remaining are Prototype and Mohican Test. The latter could be for testing the battle with Zaz. I guess. Considering that he is the only character that has a mohawk, prototype I have no idea what it could be honestly. The other maps are all pretty self-explanatory. The second tab is from the previous stage. This one just loads the last level you played. If you select this without loading any stage previously, the game just crashes. Time Attack is the exact same as stage select, but loads the levels in Time Attack. Staff Roll plays the credits. Voxel Viewer is… exactly that, a voxel viewer. Viewer. A voxel is basically a value on a regular grid in a 3D space, much like how a pixel works in a 2D bitmap. In a simpler definition, you can usually visualize them as little cubes that are rendered to form an object, so basically a 3D pixel. The games that use voxel rendering techniques usually do them like in this viewer, where you can pretty distinctly see the cubes, but they can be more detailed as well. But to be honest, I have no fucking idea what the hell is happening in this viewer. Most stages won't won't load anything, others will load either a loop or a block, with the background looking really fucking weird. Basically I have no idea what we're actually visualizing and to what purpose, but it looks cool I guess. World map loads the world map, general purpose data test does nothing, movie preview lets you watch any cutscene, from the beginning loads the game from the beginning, was E3, now unlocks everything, just seems to boot into the title screen. The only thing remaining in this debug mode is a window that you can open in stages called FX Param Editor. This is a scene configuration editor. Pressing F3 will open the window and let you edit the graphical parameters of the scene, with a ton of options to mess around with. 
When you open up the window, there is a main option called FX Scene Data. Expanding it reveals two tabs, being Config and Items. Starting by Config, the first two options don't do anything. They seem to be related to brightness settings on the Wii U. Fixed LDR refers to low dynamic range. Setting this to true appears to activate it, being more noticeable in some stages than others. Low dynamic range scenes have a limited range of brightness and contrast, compared to scenes without it or with HDR, lacking detail in highlights or shadows. The same is the case in Lost World, explaining why the scene becomes darker and less colorful. GI mode and light field mode don't do anything as well. GI stands for Global Illumination, which is a group of algorithms meant to add more realistic lighting to 3D scenes, where light bounces off of every object in the scene, reflecting it into other objects, etc. Light fields are another technology developed for the Hedgehog engine, which helps to blend the characters naturally into the environment. With this technology, Sonic is able to run through an action stage while light is being reflected off of him naturally as if he belongs there, with shadow and color being cast off the characters into the environment as well. This contrasts with past games where Sonic looks out of place in several environments. A notable example is in Sonic Colors Ultimate, when you compare it to the original Wii version, as light fields were removed in the port because it was made in a different engine making Sonic look very out of place in multiple areas. I won't get too ahead of myself, but there are a few settings coming up where you can actually mess with both the global illumination and the light fields. Draw light field sampling point shows the position of the light fields. Update light field each frame doesn't appear to do anything, but it probably does what it says it does. Draw light field region draws the... Light field region, which is basically the entire stage. The last four options don't seem to do anything as well. Two of them seem to be related to showing collision, but maybe I'm doing something wrong because it doesn't do anything for me. The items tab features four tabs which are identical to each other, with the bottom three being non functional for some reason. The tab that does work features a bunch of options as well, and here I'm really only going to cover the most interesting ones. Scene lets you change the intensity of the skyline. Activate pseudo fog, which seems to be a very slight and very close fog, as well as activate background blur, depth of field, and stuff like that. Light lets you mess around with the lighting, such as disabling global illumination, letting you precisely see its effect, as well as changing ambient light, light modes, and the lighting tint. Light field lets you change the settings attached to the light fields. Disabling them will show how out of place Sonic feels without them on. You can also change their saturation, loop luminance, all of which will show how they work. O is near lets you change the settings of the near fog, like changing distance, color, etc, allowing for some pretty cool results. Separate O is layer separates the fog from the background. O is far does the exact same as O is near but for the far fog. Glare lets you mess around with the scene brightness, producing some incredible results as you would expect. And lastly, grass setting is actually really fucking cool. It lets you change the grass behavior, like its size and wind velocity, allowing you to give a unique feel to these stages. You can even save the settings so you don't have to manually insert the values each time. And that's about it for cut and unused content. Now let's take a look at some prototypes, demos and betas. Sadly, there are no early playable builds of the game, but fortunately there are a lot of videos showcasing early demos of the game at some events. So let's start by the 14th of May build. The 14th of May build comes from a leftover video in the PC version of the game called SLW Brawl Kiosk 14th May, which I mentioned earlier in the video. This is the earliest game gameplay of the game that we have access of, being a whole month older than the E3 version, which will be covered next. The video itself is pretty short, being 2 minutes long, but still features a bunch of differences compared to the final. The levels shown here are Windy Hill Act 1 and Desert Ruins Act 2 and 3. First of all, the lighting seems to be a little bit different. The beta stages specifically feel a lot darker and feature duller colors compared to the final version. Some of these floating islands don't 
don't appear in the beta. This might be due to one of two reasons. Either they aren't really there yet, or they haven't been rendered in. The build used in the footage appears to have a lot of popping on objects, having a very low render distance compared to the final. The level geometry appears to actually be rendered most of the time, but it's very likely that these islands may not be. There are a few differences in this section. In the beta, there are more spikes, different ring positionings and no prisms, as well as no laser wisp. This build of the game doesn't actually feature any wisps at all, which may indicate that the presence of them was an afterthought, and that a decision to implement them was made in the final months of development. The wooden planks on the top of the windmills have ropes in the demo, which have been removed in the final. There is no fade out for the number rings animation. Some camera angles for the giant springs are different. There are also a few in other sections that do not exist, or are also different compared to the final ones. You can see further down in the beta desert ruins act 2 than the final one, as the fog appears to be less dense. There are also no rings behind this red ring. And lastly, these enemies are different in the beta. And that's about it for the 14th of May build. Now let's take a look at the E3 build. Sonic Lost World, much like any other Sonic game, was revealed at numerous events to showcase it to fans and press alike, including E3 2013. And much like any other game, this demo features some pretty noticeable differences compared to the final product. The stages showcased here are also Windy Hill Act 1 and Desert Ruins Act 2 and 3. Firstly, I want to mention that there are some differences present in the 14th of my build that can still be seen here, so I'm not really going to cover them again. There is a red ring here which does not exist in the final. These rings are replaced with capsules in the final. The introduction for Desert Ruins Act 3 is very different. The title card itself doesn't have the S pop-up letter to rename the stage to Desert Ruins Act 3, keeping the original level name. The starting sequence itself isn't totally automated like the final one, having some enemies that were omitted and different camera angles. The enemy arrangement here is different. These enemies are replaced with a single moto bug in the demo. It also has much less enemies than the final version for some reason. The graphic used for the... honey? Dropped by this bednik is different between both builds. The demo is missing a life here. And the demo's Desert Ruins Act 2 ends earlier with a capsule on the totem head, featuring no boss fight with Zozom. And that's about it for the E3 demo. Now let's get into the Gamescom build. This is another demo made specifically for an event, this time Gamescom 2013. This one doesn't feature as many differences as the others did, but does feature other stages that did not appear in any of the other demos, with the stages featured being Windy Hill Act 2, Frozen Factory Act 2 and 3 and Silent Forest Act 1. There is a never before seen level select specifically made for this demo, which looks quite neat. The windy level shown here is Act 2, rather than the usual Act 1, as I've mentioned before. The only difference here is that the stage ends with a capsule rather than a battle with Zaz. A stage called Frozen Factory 1 loads you into Frozen Factory Act 2. The background for this stage is a little different, having a dark blue gradient in the demo rather than the final's purplish. Some yetis are omitted between versions, having different positions sometimes as well. Frozen Factory Act 3 is very interesting. It features a hugely different color scheme compared to the final version, having a red floor instead of purple, and the chips are red and yellow instead of green and dark green. It's actually baffling how many trailers and builds of the game depict this stage with these two color differences, suggesting that changing them was basically a last minute decision. So, to finish the betas, let's take a look at the SDCC 2013 build. These capsules are still present here instead of rings, much like the E3 demo, and the casino differences are also still present, corroborating what I said before. Now let's take a look at some trailers. Well, at one trailer specifically, since all the other Lost World trailers don't really feature anything worthwhile to cover. The trailer we'll be taking a look at is the Reveal trailer, released on the 30th of May of 2013. The only notable difference here is a different color for the laser prisms, being dark blue instead of light blue. This trailer actually lets us speculate some things. Do you remember when I said that the kiosk footage, which was left over in the files, was from the 14th of May based on the file name? Well, it might be an even earlier build than that. We
we know that the UI files were made on the 5th of July of 2012, and this trailer already had wisps, unlike the kiosk footage. Considering that the reveal trailer appears to depict a somewhat earlier build than the E3 one, which was made available two weeks later, it is very likely that the kiosk footage is from around late 2012 to early 2013. Considering that it omits several features seen in the reveal trailer, also having differences not present between the trailer and the E3 demo itself. There really isn't more early footage of this game, which is quite sad, considering that the existing footage leaves us with some pretty interesting changes and stuff to speculate. So, to close this section off, let's take a look at some concept art. Unlike many other games, the concept art for Lost World was presented in two different blog posts in the official Sega blog, with additional developer commentary, surprisingly. They seem to be written in somewhat poor English, so I'll try my best to fix some errors errors without messing with the aura of these comments. We wanted to make it look like an army, so we were thinking of making another color version for the leader, but unfortunately we didn't have the chance to use the leader type, meaning that they scrapped another variant of the Anton Badnik. This is one of the few enemies which are an original design for Lost World. The motif is an ant lion. When we designed this buzz bomber, we decided the concept of the eyes of all enemies for this title, so we tried various types of eyes on this enemy. Instead of adding details, we wanted to make it simple but huge, and wanted to make the players feel the largeness with this cap when we designed this. They probably meant that they wanted to make the player feel really small when they saw it, as depicted in the concept art. It was the very first enemy we designed in this title, so we had many ideas for this enemy. We wanted to make the design simple so the entire silhouette would fit in a single sphere. All wisps have three legs, but if you look closely, each one has a different different shape in their legs too. The concept art depicts early designs for the bomb, eagle and the rhythm wisp going off of their color. The eagle was supposed to only have one eye and would fly by flapping its wings, which looks hugely different from the final design. The other design appears to be closer to its final design, though with less eyes and no spikes on the back of its head. On the opposite side, the bomb was supposed to have eyes and no mouth, and would have a fuse on the top of its heads body? The last pink wisp could be the rhythm, based on the color only, but it looks nothing like any other wisp in this game. The main motif was an ogre, and each one was designed by following the keyword which we had for each of them. We think that you can see their characteristic just by looking at them, an early development idea which the gears are rotating in different directions. Looks painful if you get sandwiched. This is actually very interesting, showing that Windy Hill's terrain was conceived to be made of gears, instead of of what we know it to be today. This might even suggest that the initial idea wasn't to have the normal sausage-shaped terrain, but to have unique terrain types for each stage. The concept was totally new, so we couldn't decide the direction of the design. It was tough as we had to remake this stage over and over again. The inner cylinder was very confusing when designing, as what was ceiling would be ground next second. We were requested a simple design, but that makes it hard to create a sense of scale and made Sonic look small. Taking balance to achieve this was very difficult. When you hear desert, you will imagine Pyramid and Oasis. It's a stereotype, but we felt it was very understandable. This bird's eye view looks a lot like Arsenal Pyramid from Forces, for some reason. When you play the game, you actually can see the side part of this stage, but the design is based on a hornet's nest. You are not copying the real world, so we sometimes get lost in what kind of design is the best. When you design a a tropical stage, you really want to take a holiday and go there. I felt this way especially when I was making this stage. It looks flat in this art, but it is actually on a huge sphere, so it was very difficult to design. This concept art seems to depict Sonic as classic Sonic for some odd reason. On that note, did you know that Sonic is scaled down by 10% in the game? Here you can see a comparison between the Lost World size and what should be the normal size. Now here is a comparison of his Lost World model compared to 
direct export of classic Sonic from Generations. Interesting, isn't it? Does this mean that Lost World was supposed to be a 3D classic Sonic game? Especially when you consider the aesthetics, enemies, objects and the fucking classic Sonic live icon. Who knows? Very early image of the casino stage. There's too much blue and it may be hard to find Sonic. There are various types of plants and trees. We redesigned many times and it was very tough to make it look like a jungle. It may be hard to recognize, but we thought it would be funny if water was coming out from the eyes and nose of the Moai in the background. So we did that. This concept also has a mock-up of the game's UI, which is interesting in the sense that it looks hugely different from the final one, being much less cluttered and having a placeholder points icon. In the final HUD, there isn't even a score meter. Did Eggman run out of budget in the final stage? You can see many patches and it looks very easy to tear down this place. Here are also a few concept pieces for the Zelda DLC. Did you know that there were real-life masks of the Deadly Six? They are the sort of masks you have to cut out, then thread some string between certain parts you have to attach, you know the deal. They look dreadful. I'm glad I didn't find a single picture of someone using them online. Some promotional screenshots for Lost World also depict a few differences from the final version. The most interesting are different effects, different backgrounds and different object layouts. And that's about it for the betas and trailers. Now let's get into the trivia. It was speculated that the game's release that Sonic Team was still split into two teams. If you didn't know already, Sonic 06's development was kinda crazy. And during it, the team was split into one part developing 06 and the other developing Secret Rings. After Sonic 06, a lot of what was Sonic Team at the time got reshuffled to other departments of Sega, or were put more into managerial positions while Fresh Blood was brought in. This team was then put forth to develop Sonic Unleashed. We'll call them Sonic Team A. Meanwhile, a different team had also been formed. They focused mostly on the Wii games, being the ones who made Sonic and the Secret Rings, and later Black Knight and Colors. We'll call them Sonic Team B. The development of Colors and Generations started about at the same time, with Sonic Team A handling Generations. After those two were released, the status of these teams started to get more blurred and there wasn't really any confirmation of which team developed which game, or even if the team was still split, leaving us with the question of which team developed Lost World. Well, a brief examination of the files reveals that the folder slash file structure and file formats used share a lot of similarities with colors. As I've mentioned earlier in the video, the project's name internally is Sonic 2013, while Colors's was Sonic 2010, and almost all the directories they exported their stuff from were paths in the style of Sonic 2010, Sonic 2013, heavily hinting that Sonic Team B may have been the one developing the game, as it sounds like Lost World was built on a weird mixture of the Sonic Colors tech and a massively stripped down version of Unleashed and Generations' Hedgehog engine. On the topic of development, you may, for some reason, have noticed that Lost World is a pretty different game from both its predecessors and its successors. I'm specifically talking about level design, the absence of the boost and Sonic's moveset as a whole. As Sega officials Aaron Weber and Sam Mullen put it, the whole Parker system, conceptually, comes from the simple fact that in past Sonic games, Sonic would move really fast and he was kind of uncontrollable, and then you'd run into objects and just stop. So we went back to basic controls and said, okay, how do we get past this? People do not like running around fast, fast, fast and then stop. It started out with really simple things, like when Sonic hit a corner, he would would just glance past it, so we thought what if he runs up walls or grabs ledges, and it sort of evolved from there into the state it is now. It's a matter of giving players reasons to use that kick attack versus the homing attack, and having enemies where you'll have to use a certain combination, such as the homing attack and then a kick. It's really nice to have that kind of control in a Sonic game. It all boils down to the fact that we want a player to maintain a flow, even if they are not having a sort of perfect playthrough. This way, the flow of a high-level Sonic player can be enjoyed even by a novice player. 
the weirdest pre-order slash deluxe edition bonuses present in newer Sonic games actually started with Lost World. Pre-ordering the Wii U version from Amazon in North America gave the player 25 extra lives as a bonus. This was relatively made fun of online and is especially fucked up when you consider that collecting 100 rings didn't even give you a life until a later patch added that feature which, you know, has been in every single Sonic game before it, except for colors for some reason. If the game was instead pre-ordered through a GameStop, one would receive a rare Sonic Omochao gadget as an RC tool, not being much different than the normal Omochao RC, other than the fact that it looks like Sonic. Sega also launched two accessory kits as collector items during the Japanese release of the game. The first kit contains a protection cover for the 3DS XL models, and a small Sonic-themed storage bag. The kit also contained a soundtrack CD for the game. The second kit contained blue earbuds, which I can only imagine had incredible sound quality, and two small keychains, which were a pair of Sonic Speed shoes and Tails a set of Tails. Pre-ordering the game normally would grant a player the Deadly Six bonus edition, which included some DLC. This edition contains Nightmare Zone, with different boss fights from the original game that take place in the World of the Nights into Dream series. There was a lot of cool stuff, honestly. Shame that isn't all. There is more pre-order DLC, including a golden Omo Chao RC vehicle, I don't really get the obsession with it, but okay, and a pack that includes five more Black Wisps. Incredible. The third DLC includes Yoshi's Island Zone. There was also a Zelda DLC released later. This game shares some similarities with the cancelled Sonic Extreme for the Sega Saturn. Both games have a story where six creatures get out of Eggman's grasp, which was one of three million planned stories for the latter. Both have a first level inspired by Green Hill, though they share this aspect with every fucking title. Both have freely floating level structures and gravity playing a key role. Despite Aaron Weber noting Extreme was indeed an influence, Takashi Izuka has claimed the developers of Lost World didn't know anything about Extreme, meaning it had no intended influence on the game whatsoever. It also features a bunch of similarities with Mario Galaxy. Izuka even admitted that Sonic Lost World had ended up a bit too close to Super Mario Galaxy. The most obvious similarity is that both games use the same gravity gimmick. While SA2 did it before those games, it's undeniable that the main influence for Lost World was Super Mario Galaxy, as evidenced by other similarities. The way Sonic skates on ice and jumps is very similar to how Mario does it in Super Mario Galaxy. In both games you also have to enter the skating mode manually, otherwise you get different animations and move slower. The stages in Lost World are based on very simplistic themes unlike most past Sonic games. They are also the exact same themes used on new Super Mario Bros, with the exception of mountains. The timer in Lost World is formatted in the same way as the classic Mario games. Instead of showing minutes and seconds separately, the timer appears only in seconds, and instead of counting up, the timer counts down. Not nearly to the same extent as other Sonic games, but from the number of tweaks and adjustments to the gameplay that were made by patches, along with the correction of a few glitches, it's clear that the Wii U and PC versions weren't tested as much as they should have been prior to release. The most well-known glitch is related to Super Sonic, where he contains a rendering bug that leaves him with two mouths. Though not as known, this also happens with normal Sonic, not in his normal player model, but in the parkour after images. In the PC version, locking the game to 30 FPS results in a lot of bizarre bugs. These include insane gravity glitches, weird physics, bugged collisions, getting stuck out of nowhere, scripted sequences not working correctly, and wisps not working working as well. On the topic of glitches, the laser wisp can actually freeze time. It can be done in any level in the Wii U version that has both the laser and hint ring. To perform this, the player should go to an area that shows the hint ring and activate the laser. They must hold down the jump button and the hint ring icon on the Wii U gamepad, then press the home button. The player should now let go of the buttons and resume the software. If done correctly, the hint screen will appear on the Wii U gamepad and the laser will release on the same frame.
time. When the player exits the hint screen, the laser will fire, and time will be frozen. You won't be able to interact with any object in the stage, though you can still lock on and destroy badniks. Desert Ruins Act 2 has some pretty crazy gravity glitches as well. After the last flower cannon, the second honeycomb has a trigger that changes gravity. If the player jumps off of that side and performs a bound jump, the gravity will glitch out, resulting in lots of different outcomes. I want to give a warning now that we're gonna cover two flashing lights glitches, so if you have epilepsy or you're sensitive to flashing or bright lights, keep to the timestamp on screen. In Desert Ruins Act 4, if Sonic sticks on this wall until the tornado reaches the end of its path, he will fall below the level. After a specific amount of time, you'll go beyond the kill plane and will eventually enter a plane of existence which is filled with rapidly flashing colors for some reason. This won't stop until the time is over. The same can happen on the casino level, Frozen Factory Act 3, though it has since been patched. When interacting with a bumper in this stage, there was a small chance that a strobe effect would appear, creating lag and color errors. This was actually the first ever Sonic glitch to be discovered by accident to ever give the illusion of an epileptic seizure. Sometimes in Silent Forest Act 1 on the Wii U and PC versions, when Sonic gets caught by a mushroom thrown by a mad mole, it will clip Sonic through the floor, and he will die. Do you hate Desert Ruins Act 3? Have you ever wondered if there is a way to entirely skip it? Well then I have good news for you. By aligning Sonic in a very specific position, charging up a spin dash and then double jumping, Sonic will fall through the floor and land on another layer. By jumping again and holding left, Sonic will leave the 2D trigger and fall through the stage. Wait for the camera to change once, then again, wait one second and perform a double jump, then a bound jump, and you'll be right at the end of the level. In the opening cutscene, the tornado's wing gets shot. But in the cutscene at the end of Windy Hill, Tails says that he fixed the plane's propeller. During one of the cutscenes, after Cubot has his body destroyed, Orbot says, Alas, poor Cubot, I knew him well. Arr! This is a reference to the often misquoted line from Shakespeare's Hamlet. The Hidden World Act 2 theme is an instrumental and remixed version of Tails' theme from Sonic Adventure 2. Interestingly, the song for Desert Ruins Act 2 resembles a lot the song for Skyscraper Scamper Day from Unleashed. Using the bomb next to a gossip stone in the Zelda stage will make it take off like a rocket, much like in Ocarina of Time. Sonic Lost World for the 3DS was the last handheld game developed by Dimps. This Dimps made line of handheld Sonic games were already shifted from being original titles to reformulated versions of the mainline console games, thanks to the underperformance of Sonic Rush Adventure. But a negative reception to their 3DS version of Lost World entered the handheld line entirely, leading to Dimps retiring from the Sonic franchise. The next two handheld games in the franchise, Sonic Boom Shattered Crystal and Fire and Ice, were mere spin-offs and were developed by Sanzaru Games, but their own poor reception seems to have merely killed the handheld line entirely. According to an interview with Ken Pontac, Orbot and Cubot were almost scrapped from Lost World and the series entirely, and he had to ask for their inclusion in the story. 
Eggman, when betrayed by the Zeddy, is so pissed off that he ends up going to a very dark place with his threats. The severity of his mood and words are so off-putting that Sonic and Tails are shocked silent. Not since Sonic Adventure has Eggman been this ferocious and genuinely frightening. What's more is when Eggman makes his last threat to Zavok and Zaz, their facial expressions actually change from amused to surprised. Mild for Zavok supposedly and rather clear shock from Zaz. It didn't look like either of them were smugly smiling at that moment, they were surprised that Eggman went there with his threats. Speaking of Eggman, later in the game, he proposes an idea to Sonic about causing the Lost Hex to implode as a way of defeating the Deadly Six, basically saying he is willing to commit genocide just to kill his enemies, and the fact that he can so offhandedly suggest this in such a casual way paints him in a whole new frightening light. Also, why did Eggman team up with his worst enemy to defeat a Deadly Six, just so he could kill kill Sonic himself. Finally, when he does get complete control of the situation again, he upstages the Deadly Six as a villain and uses a mech that is powered by a lot of energy that was stolen through the extractor. Imagine how many living beings lost their life just for the cape of that thing. To a lesser degree, there is what Eggman says regarding the damage done by the Zeddy. Hammering in how he fully acknowledges the energy used to power his mech was taken from a planet sucked dry, and he doesn't even care. Also, when Eggman speaks to the Zeddy about eating their black hearts during his little freakout moment, it seems really out of place for him. But then you have to consider, Zozom spoke several times about eating Sonic and Eggman, and even Xena mentioned eating Sonic at one point, so they are probably a race of cannibals. Eggman was just speaking to them in terms they could understand. How nice of him. Though sometimes this does get kind out of hand, a lot of Zozom's lines revolve around wanting to eat Sonic, with a bunch Bunch of them being rather easy to take out of context. Mm. You look like a giant blueberry, all plump, juicy. I wonder if those spines stick to my throat when I swallow them whole. Tails claims to have made a TV out of paper clips and reprogrammed a supercomputer with dishwashing detergent and a toothpick. Unless other elements were involved, he is absolutely capping and that quote is fucking ridiculous. On the same note, the story in this game, though the writing doesn't really do it much justice, kinda paints Sonic as a prick. A major conflict in the game is how Tails starts feeling like Sonic is beginning to lose faith in him in favor of Eggman and just wants to be of use to his hero. However, it was completely reasonable to assume that the Extractor's inventor would know best how to turn it off. Tails made little objection to even allowing him to help in the first place, and it's not like this is the first time they have joined hands with Eggman against a greater threat. Sonic was already feeling pretty bad about endangering the world because of his recklessness, but things just get worse from there. His best friend gets captured and is planned to be roboticized. His other friends presumably get the life sucked out of them, and the last thing he sees of his only remaining allies is them falling towards a river of lava. No wonder Sonic is so distraught throughout the second half of the game. I mean, Tails gets injured and captured due to Sonic's recklessness, yet in the cutscene where he gets captured, Sonic says he was too slow to save his buddy, even though it was his fast and reckless actions that got Tails captured. Stupid fucking idiot. No wonder Tails feels hurt because his best friend seems to trust a egomaniacal madman who tried to kill them for years over him. Him. I personally love how Sonic admits he should have listened to Tails and then proceeds to be reckless once again. The newly added video options menu in the PC port looks quite different from the rest of the menus. There is no animation for the menu opening, the bounce effect that appears when changing options is different and the text is more pixelated. If you hold the rolling button while running up walls, Sonic will suddenly stop and start to slide down. Eventually he will just jump off and do a cool landing animation, which seems to be a pretty obscure part of his moveset. Each member of the Deadly Six represents one of seven deadly sins. Zevok is Pride, Zaz is Wrath, Zozom is Gluttony, Master Zeke is Envy, Xena is Greed and Zor is Sloth. Of course, there is no lust because it's a kid's game, don't be fucking weird. You might be asking where I got this piece of trivia from. I just made it up really, but it does make sense if you think about it. 
If you modify the game's files and try to load an invalid hint entry, you will get a message that says it is a text not existing. In the game, it's never explained to us what Lost Hex is. Is it a planet? Is it just floating on the sky? How is it lost if it's that huge? How do you miss that thing? How does Tails know about it? Do only small animals, wisps and zeddy live there? The Japanese script says it's a future continent, I think, which says absolutely fucking nothing. Sonic's eyes are not aligned correctly in this official render of Sonic Lost World. Now that you've seen it, you'll never be able to unsee it. For some time, it was thought that the controller illustration that appears when you open the PC port was stolen from the DeviantArt user Asirianic. Since the license of the original illustration does not allow commercial use, it made the use of the image within the game illegal. Actually, and to clear any doubts, this image is from the open clip art, so it's free to use. The Super Sonic fights from Frontiers are actually inspired from cut boss fights for Lost World. According to a 2022 interview with Morio Kishimoto, who directed both games, he already had the idea of every boss fight being an epic supersonic fight, but they couldn't implement it at the time. And lastly, there was a prequel comic made by Archie to help promote Sonic Lost World, probably being the most forgotten of the prequel comics, despite it being the longest adaptation out of any other. The issue issue begins with Eggman or Bot and Cubot in the Eggmobile. They have just discovered the Lost Hex and are planning to colonize it. After landing, the group meets Zavok, who starts destroying badniks and tries to hit Eggman, but he pulls out the cacophonic conch and plays it. He then orders the Zeddy to capture all the Mobini and bring them to him in a capsule. A few hours ago in Green Hill Zone, Sonic got a tip by Tails, who asked him to reach Amy and Knuckles. They are comforting a few Mobini, worried for their captured friends. Sonic and Tails assure them that they will find the animals and they get a tornado. A few moments later, the duo spots Eggman in the Eggmobile, carrying a capsule full of animals. Sonic forces Eggman to drop it and he does so. Sonic fails the attempt to grab the capsule and while following the capsule, Eggman shoots the tornado with his laser gun, but Tails keeps the control. Shortly after, Sonic and Tails spot the Lost Hex and they prepare for landing. This last part is a word-for-word -word recreation of the intro cutscene as well, which is interesting. Also, the way Eggman uses the conch to control the Deadly Six is based off of the Horagai, the traditional Japanese usage of conch shells as trumpets. And that's all I have for this episode. It didn't have as much cut and unused content to cover as other games did, but the one that was present was still very interesting to cover, and I hope that you learned something from it. I have made videos like this one for Sonic Adventure, Sonic Adventure 2, Heroes, the Rider series, 06, Unleashed, Colors, Generations and Forces, so I recommend checking them out if you want. On that topic, I want to let you guys know that I'll be remaking my old bonus videos, more specifically Heroes, 06, Unleashed, Generations and SA2, by the same order that they were released originally. The remakes will feature everything I covered originally, but with a lot more content as well, so stay tuned for that. There will still be a non-bonus video before the first remake, but a Heroes remake should be the next bonus video, unless the Shadow the Hedgehog prototypes get dumped. If you're wondering why I'm remaking them, they are really bad and very incomplete. They are very important games to cover and I want to bring them up to standard to my new videos, meaning that I probably won't have to remake them further down the line. Usual stuff here, which I appreciate all of you that stick around to hear it, consider subscribing if you haven't already if you enjoy my content, as these videos take a long time and a lot of work to make, so I recommend activating notifications as well, so you do know when the next one comes out. I have a Patreon where you can support me for quite cheap and get a few perks and whatnot, like early access to videos. I also have a Twitter if you want to follow me there, and be sure to check out my community tab once in a while, as I post quite frequently there. And that's about it really. I'll hopefully see you soon.